moving. This will be, I believe, the last lesson of the tricky topics. Um, the Lord might change that, and that's fine, but I believe this will wrap it up. Today we're going to talk about service participation. Service participation, which is kind of a broad subject, but remember, all of these tricky topics, we're dealing with things that you would do during the church service, right? Those are, that's the tricky aspect of it. How do you participate while you're at church? Now, certain of you, many of you, have a, a specific thing you do, whether it's the audiovisual table, whether it's an usher, some people help set up, we have a piano player, so obviously there are things you could do. We're going to talk beyond that, just the general common member that comes, the common attendee that comes, what, are, what is expected of you in, in participation, and what could you do, some different ideas, and sometimes there is a gray area. Culture does come into play here, because depending on where you're at in the world, certain behaviors are going to seem a little more strange than others, right? And, and we have to recognize that, but there are some things biblically that I think it's good to recognize. So Psalm 84, verse number 10, it says here, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I like that. You can have a thousand days outside of God's house, if you will. The courts, right? That's the courtyard of the temple. This would be the equivalent of standing outside in the grassy, sunny area just in front of this uh, Saul, this, this church uh, sanctuary now. So three and a half years, right? A thousand days outside of that. I, I'd rather have one day here at church than a thousand days away from it. That's saying a lot. Then he says, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now the tents of wickedness, you're, you're kind of thinking of that party, right? The rioting, the Bible calls it, where you would sneak off and do something that you ought not be doing. It's that one night pleasure kind of thing. He said, I'd, I'd rather, instead of having these big massive parties going from tent to tent and house to house, I'd rather just have a small job in the house of my God. And, and the reason I point that out is this person, the author here, wants to be involved. They want to participate. Rather than just come to the house of God, let me, let me do something. What can I do? I'll hold a door. Now that's something anybody could do, right? Let me just stand at the door and make sure people can find the way in. Maybe shake their hand on the way in. You know, a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Look at Psalm 27. Verse 4, so maybe you ask yourself this morning, I like coming to the house of God and maybe there's more I could do there. And maybe it's not something big, maybe it's something small, just keeping a door. Psalm 27 and verse 4, he says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. I like this, I'll seek after it. One thing I desire of him, and I'm not going to wait around for God to force it on me. I'm going to go looking for a way to make this happen. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. So any day that the house of the Lord is open and I'm expected to be there, I'm seeking a way to be there. Do you see this? Okay. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Do you see? I'm not just going to go there and sit there. I'm going there with a purpose in mind. I'm seeking after something. I'm going to look for the glory or the beauty of the Lord. I want to see how great He is. And if I don't find it when I immediately get there, I'll ask for it. And there's a good chance, right? You come to church, you come to the house of God, and maybe you've had a tough week, and you have some questions. Lord, why this? Why that? I'm going to go to the house of God looking for answers. So these are all things you can do to participate. You go to church on purpose. You go to church on with a purpose. So at the very least, you show up with a desire, right? One thing have I desired, I want to be there. I'm here to learn. I'm here to see God and so forth. So going on purpose. Look at John chapter 2 now. Service participation. The old saying is, if you look for nothing, you'll find it. If you come to church looking for nothing, expecting nothing, you're guaranteed to get exactly that. <laughs> but if you go ready to participate, be a part of the service, even if it's just coming to listen intently, that's participating. 
be an active listener. We'll talk more about that in a moment. John 2, let's begin reading verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge, that's a whip, of small cords. Now, he, he, he has this whip, right, these little ropes, and then he would tie knots in it. You understand that? A whip is strong enough. Now you're tying little knots in it so that when you strike, whack, <laughs> that'll really get your attention. And poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. Now, Jesus went to the temple. He participated. <laughs> I am not suggesting that you come down the aisle today and overthrow the communion table and push the pulpit over. Please, please. Uh, but learn the lesson here, verse 16, and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. So this isn't a place to come and make money. This isn't a business opportunity, right? They were treating it like that. Um, so when you come to the house of God, come for the right reasons. It's a house of prayer. It's a house of praise. You can read these things in the Old Testament. Verse 17, and his disciples remembered that it was written and then they're going to, he's quoting Psalm 69, verse 9. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus, as the prophesied Messiah, is fulfilling that scripture from Psalm 69, 9. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. He, we, we still use that phrase today. He's eaten up with it. He's just consumed by it. A zeal for God's house. Not just to be there, but to see things work properly, decently and in order, and to be part of what's happening there. That's how our Savior did it, and we would do well to follow those footsteps. Now, come to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. And verse number 26, let's begin reading there. In 1 Corinthians 14, it's important to recognize that this chapter is dealing with public assembly. 1 Corinthians 14 is not dealing with private worship of God. Please understand that. You can learn some things about individual or private worship, sure, but the, the focus of the chapter is when we assemble as the assembly, what should we do? How should we operate during the church service? That's what the chapter is about. Now, in verse 26, we have some warnings that are going to be brought about here. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue. Right. <clears throat> so the first warning here, you guys are coming together, good, and everybody's participating. <laughs> Do you see that? Everybody shows up and says, ooh, I want to be part of the service. I have, a, I have a song. And the next guy, but I have a new teaching I've been studying from the Bible. And the next guy says, I learned a new language this week. It's not some gibberish stuff, but, but honestly, they learned a different language, and they want to impress everybody with it. And then another guy says, yeah, but I, I got this great revelation. God spoke to me this week. They all want to contribute. And Paul says, good, okay, but guys, make sure the motive is right. Are you trying to help the church? Are you, are you trying to be a blessing to others and get them closer to Christ and teach them something about the Lord? Or are you doing this simply to be seen of men? Right? So you remember this in Matthew 6? Jesus said, when you give, don't blow the trumpet. When you pray, you don't do it out in public just to be seen and heard of men. When you fast, anoint your head. Don't walk around with dirt on your head and your clothes all rent looking like you're fasting. Just go about your day. Don't do it to be seen of men. So participate, absolutely. None of the things mentioned in verse 26 are bad or wrong. If you want to participate in that way, great. We will organize that, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. So we'll organize those efforts. But we want to make sure that the motive is right. So participate, yes, but not to be seen and heard, but rather to help. All right Now another warning in the passage, verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So if someone happens to pitch up at the service, and they're going to give a testimony or speak in any capacity, but they don't speak a known language in our church. Maybe they speak, for instance, just for example, they speak Chinese. Right? None of you speak Chinese that I know of. 
No? All right, Shay Shay. So, so they, <laughs> that means thank you, by the way. That, that's like half the Chinese I know. Ni hao, hung hao, Shay Shay. That's about all I know. So, all right, so if somebody comes and speaking Chinese, we got to have an interpreter for that guy. But we cannot have Chinese, Japanese, Hindi, uh, and, and Spanish. We can't bring in all the languages we want. We have to limit that to ideal three at the most. That's what he's saying. Why? You don't want to overload the service. You can have so much participation, it begins to feel like a circus. And it's just one thing after another, and you as the listener, you're getting bombarded. Okay, now I heard this, and I heard that, and it's hard to keep track. It's difficult enough to listen to just two lessons on a Sunday morning and walk away remembering what you've heard. We don't want to bombard you with too much. So look at verse 29, much the same idea. So if you're going to have a different languages, limit it to three. Verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. So Paul doesn't spell it out as much as he did in verse number 27 because he just said that, saying if you got people wanting to speak in an unknown language, that is the people don't know it, get an interpreter, do it one by one, no more than three, that way there's organization. But if you want to have preachers, somebody to stand up and preach in a language that the church does know, also limit that to three. Two, okay, three at the most. Why? Because if you listen to seven or eight sermons in one time of assembling that's how do you walk away retaining that it's just too much so the participation's good but you don't want to overload it all right another thing verse 32 and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets don't lose control of your emotions St stay under control so participate yes but the idea of just letting loose and not even thinking about how you're acting now, this is true of the preacher. I have seen some preachers and heard some preachers that got so excited, I was no longer listening to the sermon. I was just watching to see if he would hurt himself. He was so excited. Calm down just a bit, right? But this also applies on the other side of the pulpit. Yes, I need to be under control. I can't lose it, but neither should the people listening. Right, so I have seen this sometimes in churches where people just get excited. They'll get up and start running around the church. I've been in services like that, Bible-believing churches, not charismatic stuff, but they just start, we called it running the bases. Now, I like that people are excited, I love the participation, and that's why I say maybe culturally, that wouldn't be strange in some places. If that happened here, <laughs> juju, <laughs> you just got jujued, <laughs> right? You, the, the tokolos is chasing you, <laughs> that's, that's what we would think, right? So it'd be a little bit strange. Okay, so that being... I, all of a sudden, my microphone just shot up. I'm not sure what happened there. So don't lose control. And guys, you know this happens in some assemblies where people will get excited during part of the service and then floop, they'll flop over on the floor and, blah, 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 and that kind of thing. They've lost it. You, that, verse 32 warns us, don't, don't get into that crazy or ecstatic state. All right, another thing, verse 33 for God is not the, sorry guys, can you turn me down just a bit as well? I'm, I'm ringing, I can hear it up here. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. God's not the author of confusion. So don't confuse people. Participate, yes, but not to the point of confusion. And I think this kind of encapsulates everything else that he's saying. If you overload the service and people lose control and their emotions get the better of them and they stop thinking about what they're doing, then all of a sudden it gets confusing. That's what we're trying to avoid. And then he gives another thing in verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Now, what is he doing here? Is he saying women can't participate? No, he's giving order. This is structured. He, Paul is, is putting this uh, regulation, if you will, in the local church for two reasons. Number one, this is what is written in the law, and he quotes it. You can see, verse 34, it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So Paul is taking a template from the law and saying this is how it was set up. Men were leading the religious worship, so we're going to do it that way in the local church. And then in 1 Timothy 2, he also gives the very same command about women keeping silence, but then he goes all the way back to Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And he says, Adam was first formed, 
Adam wasn't deceived. It was Eve that was deceived. So based on how God set it up in, a, in Genesis chapter 3, it says there the husband would rule over the wife. Amen. That, that, we're all excited on that point. That's Genesis 3. That's the structure for the home. Yes? Yes? That's the structure for the home, and that's the structure we should have in the local church. So Paul says it would be confusing if in your home, the husband rules in the home, and the man is in charge, and then you get to the church, and all of a sudden, a woman's in charge. So he said, in order to, to limit the confusion, we're going to keep this one stable thing of the man leading the services. All right, now that's not to say a woman can't participate in other ways. So we'll look at some of that. Guys, I'm so sorry. My microphone is cutting in and out, yes? It, I, I'm hearing it going up and down, right? I'm seeing some of you also saying it's going up and down. I'm not sure what's going on there. Are, are my batteries dying? Not sure? Okay. Well, on we go. All right, so what can we do? I've given you these warnings. Within this chapter, there are a, a, a handful of things that are mentioned. And I think these things are going to be pretty obvious. But I want to speak specifically about these things. Uh, number one, singing. I think you can find it in what, verse 15? Look at verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. So I'm going to sing in a language that I understand, but when I do it, I'm going to sing, not just going through the motions, but I'm going to sing with the Spirit, with all my heart. I'm going to put my back into it, as they say. Yeah? So here's a good way that you can participate in the service. Simple way to get involved. When it's time to sing, sing. Really sing. Now, can I, can I put a few uh, uh, regulations on that? Wow, there I go again. What in the world? These speakers are playing games with us this morning. So here's a few regulations. Sing, sing loudly. That's the book of Psalms. Sing loudly. But also sing on key. Amen. If you cannot sing on key, sing just loud enough to be part of the song, but listen to how others are hitting the note and then follow them. That's just good advice. And then also sing joyfully. Sing joyfully. The, the, we try to choose our songs carefully so that as you sing them, they can edify you. Pay attention to the words, right? Try to get a blessing. We want to sing with the understanding also. That's why we use a language we know so that we can go through the words and go, man, this is a blessing. I mean what I'm singing. Really get into it. That does a lot to, as you participate. Now, another thing, and this might seem obvious, in verse 15, you can see it. Um, pray. At various times in the service, and I know you, you might take it as a mere formality. You know, before the offering, we pray. Before the sermon, we pray. That's fine. But as somebody is praying, pray. Actually pray. Talk to God. Don't just let that guy do the talking. Talk to God and say, God, me too. I, 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 I want to get in on whatever the sermon's going to be about. God, help me to give as you told me to give. And even as you go, you might be in constant communion with the Lord. Lord, help me to understand this point. Lord, help so-and-so. I think somebody here could get a blessing. Somebody else needs to hear, whoever it is. Let somebody get saved. Pray as you go. Pray before you come. Right? I know that's not participating in the service, but it's a way to prepare for the service. And if you've prayed for it, you'll probably participate more while you're here. So I'm not going to ask for you know, anybody to raise their hands, but I, I'm just curious how many of you prayed for the service this morning before you came. Because I believe it would impact your time while you're here. All right, another thing you can do while you're here, this is going to sound a little strange, but you can preach. Now, when I say you can preach, uh, you can, men, you can preach, and if any of you would like to learn, we can be more than happy to teach you and, and help you with that. But you say, well, Brother Mike, I'm not called to do that. Not a problem. Be active, participate in the sermon. Be an active listener while somebody is preaching. So let me just, one little tip on that. If you were standing here right now, just picture that, men. Ladies, you can also picture it because we have had various ladies teach ladies' meetings. Right, teaching a group of ladies, which is biblically right and necessary. What if you were the one standing here now? What kind of listeners would you like to have? Would you like for them to be counting the lights? Or would you like for them to be locked in 
and following along, right? I mean, it's an obvious question, but just keep that in mind as the sermon's going about. All right, another thing. Greet visitors. Greet visitors. Now, you wouldn't, you'd say, but, you know, that's, it's not mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14, but in Romans 12, the Bible says to be given to hospitality. It's also in 1 Peter 4, given to hospitality. So as you see people coming in, just say, I'm glad you're here. Say, I'm not an usher. Who said you had to be an usher? Right? We do have people dedicated to certain jobs, yes, and we hope that they'd greet and get some names and make people feel welcome. But guys, we want everybody to participate in that to some extent. I'll take it a step further. How about you do this? You find somebody that's maybe come to church a time or two, three, four times. Go over and say, hey, I've, I've been seeing you here. Really great that you've been coming back. Uh, would you like to go to lunch? Just want to take you out for lunch, just get to know you a bit. Just make them feel welcome. That's hospitality, right? A common spray. God knows you know how to do that. Use it for the Lord. Use it for the Lord. All right, 1 Corinthians 16, you can just flip over a couple pages. Give you another thing. Verse 1. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Now notice he's given order. There's structure for the local church. Here's how you have a service. Here's how you can participate. Verse 2, upon the first day of the week, that's Sunday, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So another way you can participate is to give. And Paul says, prepare that. While you're at home, lay, lay it by. Get, get it ready. And that way when I show up, you don't have to run back home to gather it. You, you have it in the service. And it's, uh, it, the Bible tells us, give cheerfully. Right? So this is something you can look forward to. God, I, I want to show you just how much I appreciate how you have prospered me. This is your chance to say thank you to God and recognize how good he's been to you. Do you see it in verse 2? As God hath prospered him. So you need to give accordingly. And during the service, now it, obviously you're not limited to the church service when you give. You can give anytime, anywhere. But this is an opportunity to do it. Last week we talked about tithing. And I, I just want to say, I've never ever been disappointed with this church, with you guys, when it comes to money. And you guys... Amen. You guys, <coughs> you, you guys have been extremely generous since day one, and I mean that. Last week we had that lesson on tithing, and again, you guys responded very, very well to that. And, and several people came with questions and, and so forth. I really appreciate the way you guys take that. I, it's been over 10 years that we've had this church. I've never taught a lesson in church on tithing. I never really needed to. But then I noticed as of last week, there were actually several good questions along those lines. So I'm very glad that we covered that subject. And, and I just want to encourage you, if you have more questions about it, ask. Because it is an important part of, of the Christian life and of the local church. All right, there is one other. I, I'm going to get in a little deeper on, on something in 1 Corinthians 14. But so you can come back to that, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 17. <clears throat> but I'm going to slip something in just real quick kind of like the negative side of it. I've been telling you what you can do. Let me slip this in quickly. Here's what not to do. Don't be a distraction. Now, we had a lesson, what, two, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, about child care in the church, and, and we just had a, an example of it. Kids are going to, woo all of a sudden in the middle of the service. That, that happens, right? I mean, there's only so much you can do, so everybody needs to be patient with that. But moms, dads, just be mindful that other people are here trying to listen and learn. Keep those kids under control as best you can. Uh, so try not to distract others while they're here. Uh, we don't want to be focusing on you, but rather on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and on the Bible. But another thing I, I think needs to be addressed is devices in church. And when I say devices, I'm talking these things, right? So I usually, I rarely make announcements about let's make sure your phones are off. But usually what? Once a week, usually once a Sunday, we do have a device go off. It, it would be a great habit to get into as soon as you come through the door, airplane mode that thing. Or just flat off, you know, flat out shut it off. But now some people say, you know, but pastor, it's so convenient, I have my Bible on my phone. 
you know what? There's no verse in the Bible that says you have to have a paper Bible. You can't have it on your phone. So I, and, and here I am. I have a device. <laughs> I have a device. I got more than you probably on, the, on every Sunday morning. But they are in airplane mode. I promise you that. Um, it, is a, it is a distraction when somebody in the middle of the service starts getting a call. Right? It, it is a distraction when you're looking at the Bible on your phone. And ding, even though you're on silent mode, you see the message. You, for a moment, check the message. As it, as it pops up, you know that notification. You're like, oh, somebody's right. Uh, I'll get back to that later. You just missed five seconds, right? You say, not a big deal. Well, those five seconds add up after a while. So why not just ignore that altogether? Furthermore, I think there are advantages to having your own paper version Bible open before you because it's so much easier to remember where that was at on the page. <clears throat> it's not, I'm not going to say it's impossible to remember what you saw on the phone, but the phone scrolls, you know, and it's just not as easy. You can't mark on the phone as well as, most people can't mark on their phone at all. You can highlight if you know how to use your phone, but it's so much easier to make notes in your Bible, which that's participating. Make notes, highlight something. That little nugget, you know, that one thing that God gave you for the, to write that down so you don't forget it. All right, so try to limit those distractions as, as much as you can. All right, now another thing that you can do during the service, and I think you should do, to an, to an extent. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, I, I'm sorry, I want verse 16. 16. He says here, Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, <clears throat> how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? Now, what the verse is talking about is if somebody's asked you to pray in church and you're going to give a blessing, you're going to thank God for whatever is happening in the service. If you do that in a language that the church doesn't know, how are the people in the room that have not learned that language, how are they going to say amen when you give thanks? They don't understand what you're saying. So that's the, the meat and potatoes of the verse. However, here's what I'm going to zero in on in verse 16. If you do understand what has been said, that's the proper time to say amen. <laughs> Right, so the word amen means that's right. It means so be it. I think there's a good Afrikaans, uh, there's actually several Afrikaans equivalents to this, but one of them would be asai. Da farai. Something like that, right? You could slip that in. There, there are different expressions that would be appropriate. Amen is a biblical, a biblical word, right? There are two words you'll find in almost every language on the planet. And I mean this, every language, they do not translate it, they transliterate this from Hebrew. You get the word amen and you get the word hallelujah. But in, in Afrikaans, you can hear those amen, hallelujah. I mean, I know you pronounce it slightly differently. In Chichewa, we say alleluia, amen. I mean, it's, it's the same. In every language I've visited in India, amen, hallelujah, it just comes out the same. So hallelujah means praise the Lord. Amen means so be it or that's right. So when somebody has said something true, and it's a valid point, you can support that. You don't have to stand up and go, amen. I, if you're in North Carolina in America, that fits in perfect. If you sit there quiet the whole service, something's wrong with you. <laughs> right? That's why I say culture does factor into this a bit. I get it. But there are times where an amen would really help the service. It really would. It, it helps it almost punctuates the point that the preacher's making. And thereby the church, this should be a little bit of give and take where I'm giving you a good point and to acknowledge that it landed, you go, yeah, amen, amen. And it doesn't have to be real loud. It can be loud enough just so that your wife next to you knows that you're still awake. <laughs> yeah. it, can be, it can be just subtle, a amen, amen. I know some of you are like, that's my way out. I'll just close my eyes and every now and then, amen. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah amen. <laughs> Your mind is elsewhere. But amen. Amen. <laughs> Which leads me to the next thing. Be very careful that you put the amens where they should be. Right? This should be an educated amen. Don't just throw them out there willy-nilly. Just, just think about it before you say it. There was a famous African-American preacher. 
I think he recently passed away, if I'm not mistaken, but maybe, maybe didn't. Jasper Williams. And he has a couple sermons that he's very well known for. And uh, one of them was called, I Fell in Love with a Prostitute. And he preaches out of the book of Hosea. And because if you know the book of Hosea, Hosea was commanded by God to marry a harlot, a prostitute. So, and, and when he preaches, right, he gets it into the high hump. God told Hosea to find that harlot of a woman and to marry that prostitute. <laughs> I mean, he really gets into it. Well, he, was go he's got, he got into that sermon, and he's saying, and that woman with the long black hair. Yeah, and, and the people in the church, his entire congregation, a thousand people, they're going to, mm, yes, mm, amen. Well, now, when you're describing the prostitute, Back off that long black hair. Mm, tell it right. <laughs> easy, man, easy. <laughs> and then he, got, he went through the description. You know, the church was responding. It was a little strange. And, and then he got down to the part where he said, he said, and that, that prostitute, she's out there making her money the way she does. And one guy in the church, he goes through like, he has three different things that he rotates, you know. And he, he said, she's out there working her work and getting her money the way she does. And he said, well, that's all right. <laughs> that's not all right. <laughs> that was just the next phrase in the cue of his mind. And think before you speak, right? In, in the church where I went to Bible school, that we have one guy every Sunday, his little phrase, right before the sermon would start, he would say, to the battle. Every, every Sunday, to the battle. Okay, the first couple of Sundays, it was a little exciting. Like, yeah, to the battle. All right, here we go. We're going to preach. But then after the third and fourth month of it, we're like, okay, yes, yes, to the battle. We're in the battle. Okay, stop it. <laughs> one, one Sunday, somebody else tried to say it. So this was that one guy's phrase. Well, here comes Dr. Ruckman up to preach, and some other guy went, to the battle. And the other guy got irritated and went, oh, to the battle, <laughs> said it louder. <laughs> And then the first guy answered back and went, yeah, to the battle. I'm like, what are we doing here? This is completely, now nobody's ready for the sermon. We're just interested to see these guys go out in the parking lot and fight <laughs> and earn the right to say to the battle, which is kind of silly. Take your Bible, come to Exodus chapter 8. Now, just in case saying the word amen out loud in any sort of volume is too much to ask, and I, and I mean that, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, if that is just so far out of your comfort zone, which, come on, it really shouldn't be, but if it is, and granted, there are a few people I think that might be a bit much, I'll take a good nod. There we go. Just, just one of these. And again, that way I know. Now, now be, be careful. I want the nod, but your head needs to come back up when you nod. <laughs> right? Because otherwise it's just, <laughs> okay, you nodded, but you nodded off. <laughs> and that's, that we don't need. That's discouraging. Look, oh, he's got it. He's, oh, he's gone. Oh, shame. He, he's fought somebody. Usher, usher, catch him. You know, he's about to go. So we don't want that. Exodus chapter 8, verse 9. So Pharaoh, he called for Moses. He says, listen, I'm going to let the people go. Take the frogs away. I'll let the people go. Moses, verse 9. Moses said unto Pharaoh, glory over me. Now, there's, that's one example, biblical example, of somebody that was excited about what he just heard. And it, it, just, it was an expression of excitement. Glory over me. Glory to God, we might say. Remember when Jesus came riding on the donkey into town and they would say, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna just is a way of saying, I'm excited about this. That's it. So it, there, it's, there's biblical, or say a biblical precedent for showing that excitement by saying something like this. We had a guy in that same church I was telling you about where I went to Bible school. He didn't do it every Sunday, but when he got excited, he was about, I don't know, barren. Just, just stand up just for a moment just so people can see. He was Barnes size. Barnes not the smallest guy, right? So, so th this guy, Brother Dunleavy was his name. 
And when he, he looked like a lumberjack, he probably was, right? He was from Washington State. He probably was because he wore red flannel all the time. He, he'd get up. He would stand up during the sermon. Somebody would be preaching along. He'd get excited. He'd go, glory to God. But he said it so loud. I mean, the building would shake. <laughs> and one Sunday, it came out of nowhere. It was during the announcements. Somebody was saying something about a missionary, and he got excited about this answer to prayer, and he got up, and glory to God! He didn't realize there was an old, old Tani sitting right in front of him. She just about went to see Jesus. I mean, <laughs> she <laughs> just... So again, right, you need to have some discretion. Participate, yes, but do it smartly. Stay in control of yourself. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Let's uh, begin in verse 14. Several verses here. You'll, you'll, you'll catch on quickly. You'll catch on quickly. Deuteronomy 27, 14. You'll see it quickly as we go through this passage. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice. All right, so as they march into the land... Moses says, I want half of the tribes on this side, half of the tribes on that side. And as, they, as you march in, there's going to be some blessings, there's going to be some curses. And then he says, the Levites are going to speak and say to all the men of Israel with a loud voice. Verse 15, cursed be the man that maketh any graven image or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. So they don't take mom and dad seriously. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Verse 17. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. You're stealing his land. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way. Ah, that's just cruel. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. You see, as he's pronouncing these things, if the people don't respond with Amen, it kind of sounds like they're planning on doing those things. So he's saying, they're going to tell you what not to do, and God's going to punish you for it. You better answer. Because that's your way of kind of signing off, going, okay, I heard it, I get it, I understand it, won't do that. Yeah? Verse 19, cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless, and widow. And all the people shall say, amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, ugh, because he uncovereth his father's skirts. And all the people shall say, amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast. And all the people shall say, what? Amen. Verse 22. <laughs> oh, man, it gets dodgy, eh? It gets dodgy. <laughs> you got you to gotta make sure these things are clear. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, come on. Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. Oh, what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Why? 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 And all the people shall say, come on, men. Of course, of course, amen. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, a hitman, and all the people shall say, amen. And this last one, cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, amen. You, you see that what's going on here. Here's truth. I need to know you got it. And the way for you to... to, to to acknowledge that you got it is amen. So that same principle applies to a, a local church, to the participating thereof. Here's a point that you need, I need to know you got it. And you acknowledge that with an amen. All right, one last verse and we'll be done. Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. <clears throat> And uh, here we have Ezra down by the water gate. He's about to preach for the people. Actually, in this case, not so much preaching as he is reading out of the Bible. But Nehemiah 8, let's begin reading in verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. So that's about six hours. Six hours. He's just reading the law. The Old Testament law. Can you imagine going through Leviticus and Deuteronomy? Six hours. That's quite a bit. 
before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. There's participation. At the very least, you're paying attention. Verse 4, and Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. Now, I stand behind a pulpit of wood. In, in the Old Testament, you'd make a platform. This was the pulpit of wood, right? So slight change there. I'm not going to jump up on this pulpit. We had a guy in that church who did that once. In that church where I was in Bible school, he actually got on the pulpit of wood and preached out of this passage. None of us heard the sermon. All we were worried about is that guy falling off the pulpit. That was, that was all we thought about. All right, so in any event, verse number four, Ezra the scribe stood behind, or upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made <clears throat> for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and uh, Aniah and Urijah and Hilkiah and Maseiah. And on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah, Mish- Mishiel, Melchiah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, but he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. There's actually a lot of local churches that do that. When the pastor reads his text, the whole church stands to read the text. Um, I'm not against it. I think it's a fine thing to do. Verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, amen, amen, with lifting up their hands. You see that? And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So as Ezra is giving what we would probably call a benediction, He's read the Bible, and now he's thanking God, blessing God, our great God. All the people say, amen, amen. And then they bow their heads. Some of them probably get down on their knees, and with their faces towards the ground, they begin to worship. This is just another example of many of service participation, right? It's not limited to, sorry, it's not limited to the word amen, but it's helpful. It's helpful. This way, everybody else around you knows we're on the same page. We're together on this thing. That's a good place to stop. Let's all stand, if you would, please. So I hope that you take a moment and just consider how you can participate. I know we finished on the idea of amen, but guys, I I gave you several things that you can do during the service just to make the service a bit better, and that's your way of investing in our local church. Father, thank you this morning that we have an opportunity to participate to dwell in the house of the Lord, and to do something while we're here. Lord, we we want to enjoy our time here. We want to seek after your beauty. We want to inquire in your temple. So we do pray that you would come down and manifest yourself to us. And Lord, help us as we try to, uh, to minister to those next to us, to our neighbors here in this church. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be edifying in all things that we do. Bless our time of fellowship now. Bring us back in just a few minutes ready for the service to come. In Jesus' name, amen.